Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, mahaba, ciao, bonjour, namaste, jumbo. Bienvenidos. Hey, my name is Jed Lee. Welcome to Reading with Your Kids. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so very honored and absolutely delighted that you'll join us in our mission to help all families grow closer through reading. We do that by sharing fun, thoughtful, and thought-provoking conversations with fascinating people who just happen to be writing books for kids of all ages. You can help in our mission by telling all of your friends and family about the show and letting them know that they can hear us on the WREB AM FM 24-7 radio network and they can find us on the iHeartRadio app, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Good Pods, Podcasts, Add a CastBox, Player FM, Boom Play, Ghana, wherever you find your favorite shows. This is a, a really amazing episode for you today. Our first guest is Ian Kishere. He is the CEO of Benetech, an amazing nonprofit organization that you absolutely want to know all about. We'll also be speaking to Dr. Adria Theodore. She's celebrating her book, I Would Love You Still. And later in the show, we're listening back to a conversation we had with Jason Brotman. Director of the National Library Service. Are you looking for a creative way to bond with your kids? Let me tell you all about Drawing With Your Kids, the ultimate destination for artistic adventures. Join us as we dive into the wonderful world of children's books with renowned illustrators guiding you step by step. From beloved characters to whimsical scenes, unleash your imagination and create cherished memories together. Whether you're a seasoned artist or just picking up a pencil, there's something for everyone at Drawing With Your Kids. Please visit our website, readingwithyourkids.com, and click on the Drawing With Your Kids link at the top of the page and let the creativity flow. Drawing With Your Kids, where every stroke brings stories to life. Hey, my friends, I am really excited about our guest today. He is the CEO of Benetech, and I can't wait until you find out what this organization is doing. They're doing some really cool things. Please welcome to the show, Ian Kishore. Ian, how are you? Good. Thank you, Jed. I'm excited to be here. Uh, cannot match your excitement level in general for these shows, but very excited to be here. You know, I... I'm I'm checking out your website and I just love it. Um, Benetech is all about helping people who have learning differences um, use technology so that they can learn in the ways that that work for them and help them pursue their dreams. Yep, absolutely. So Benetech is a twenty, nearly twenty five year old nonprofit. And our goal from the beginning of time is to help support students who have learning differences and disabilities get access to an equitable education. And in our case, we've been working hard to remove barriers so that books are accessible for these learners. So, yeah, we're excited, excited to have been around for a while. And, uh, you know, the core service that we provide is Bookshare, uh, which is completely free for students in the U.S. So happy to talk to you more about that. Uh, well, let's get to it because I, I read a little bit about it. And what, it, it, am, am I remembering right? There's like a million books in Bookshare. You're right. There's about 1.3 million books in Bookshare. Wow, <laughs> that's that's amazing. That's amazing. All right, so I'm a parent. I have a child who has a um, learning difference. Maybe they have some visual problems or dyslexia. I, I need some help. I go to Benetech. How do you folks help me? Awesome. So, yes, yeah, so you've, you're probably going to hear of us through Bookshare. So Bookshare, think of it as a, a library or a collection 
uh, or if you're you know in school, there's a good chance that uh, if you have a learning difference or disability, uh, that your teacher knows about it. Um, but uh, or you know it's an accommodation that's often prescribed in schools. But if you're a parent or a caregiver and uh, you want uh, access to a ton of books that uh, uh, your child can read or you can read together with your child, you can go onto Bookshare and sign up. Um, Bookshare is subsidized thanks to support from the U.S. Department of Education. So like I mentioned, it's free for any child or student in the U.S. You come in, there's a good chance you will find the book that you're looking for because it's it's uh, such a large, uh, it's actually the world's largest collection of accessible content uh, that's digitally available. Uh, and then you pick a book, it could be anything from reading, you know, Harry Potter to something that's more, you know, relevant for your class or something that's just something fun that you want to read because, I don't know, you're interested in some mythical creatures that, uh, um, uh, and it's a, you know, weird piece of content that you may not find so But you go in there and any book you can read in any, in, in all sorts of different formats that's relevant for you and can, it's based on your style of reading. So say for example, uh, you are uh, blind or visually impaired and uh, like to read particularly by listening to books. So, you know, you could basically have a book that's available to you through text-to-speech. Uh, uh, you have these neural voices, also so there are some human voices that you can, uh, that can, you know, read it aloud with you uh, and for you. Or you can go in if you have, uh, particularly students who have dyslexia and learners with dyslexia, go in and they can, um, you know, have words highlighted along with audio, which is really helpful and focused. There's a lot of evidence around that. Or you can change the typography and pages and all you know, all sorts of different ways to, you know, get in the way you want. Uh, if you have a refreshable Braille device, you could get a download in that. So that's how, you know, Bookshare has been for all these years. We've served over, you know, 1.5 million students around the world, uh, mostly in the U.S., in, you know, getting access to books and read um, in ways that works for them. That's in- incredible. The, the I think you said refreshable Braille. Am I right? <laughs> Yeah. Is that, we, we had uh, folks from the um, National Library um, come on, and they were telling that there was a technology, um, and I think this is what it is. That the, there's a pad, and you put your – and then the Braille comes up, and it's it, – so you don't have this big Braille uh, physical book anymore, but it's just on a pad. I, and I know that was completely incoherent, but um, hopefully, hopefully you no, understand. You're, you're right, yeah. I, no, you're right. Actually, a lot of Braille readers use uh, refreshable Braille devices, but, you know, you get a couple of lines of Braille that, uh, you know, these pop-up pins that you can use to, and so you can download these books and, you know, go line by line, and it keeps refreshing the pin so you can read it. Uh, it's definitely more portable than carrying a, a, a Braille book. So that's, and, and I think they're now building new types of tools and technologies so that you can have multi-line refreshable Braille devices as well. Uh, in- incredible. Incredible. We, we've talked a lot about dyslexia here, and I've tried to um, have a better understanding of it. And, uh, and and it's been seven years, and I've completely failed. But um, <laughs> so maybe, <laughs> but it, but it sounds like there's not an easy way to describe it. Like all kids who have dyslexia are experiencing X or Y or Z. Um, how does the te- to- text to talk with the highlighted words, how does that help somebody who's struggling with dyslexia? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So, and you've done a great job. I, you know, I think I just heard an episode of, you know, having a, a you know, a story about a dyslexic taxi cab. Uh, oh. And uh, uh, so, you, you know, it's, it's great to see that you have. So the truth about it is that we all learn differently, right? We are all, uh, uh, you know, we all have some form of neurodivergence, right? Um, and, uh, you know, dyslexia is, is a known group of, uh, of um, uh, neurodivergence that, you know, it impacts a good number of our among us, right? I think about, you know, 15 to 20 percent of us. But the there is, you know, there are tried and tested methods in the past that actually have helped learners, right? Think of when you're reading a book, one of the most well-tested um, methods is you take a, a scale or a ruler, right? And you basically put it under a line. So you've blocked out the view of the other things from the text. You have that single text. Your focus is more. And it allows you to zoom, you know, to actually, you know, really uh, uh, hone into what you're trying to read and reduce some of the other distractions. Uh, we know that there are certain types of uh, typography that is actually easier to be able to decode the letters and so on and so forth. So all of these things that are, uh, you know, were hard to do traditionally and say print, right? You had to physically hold this thing on, you know, on top of a line, or if it was a different font, you 
pretty much don't have any choice. But if you have it in digital format, that's accessible. Not all digital formats are accessible. So if you do have an accessible digital book, you know, it's easy enough to change the font uh, to something that is easier to read. Or if it is, uh, you know, increase the size of the letters. But in case, in, in the case that I'm talking about, which is, you know, there's a word level hiding along with a line level highlight. Um, that allows you, along with audio, that, you know, provides all these different uh, modalities that allows you to actually increase your comprehension. So, for example, we did a study at Title I schools in Clark County last year and uh, in Nevada, and we found that, uh, you know, just having this sort of accommodation that I'm describing helps students with dyslexia really, you know, improve their reading comprehension almost instantaneously by about half a grade level. So it's a simple thing such as this that, you know, technology can provide that can really help you on your learning and reading journey. It, that's it, it's it's really incredible. Um, I was speaking to an author last night. Um, just the ability to uh, my my wife taught for over thirty four years, and we get lots and lots of books sent here um, to the studio. And um, she'll look at them, and very oftentimes she'll just close a book up, and she's like, "Not enough white space. Too many more. Too many <laughs> letters on the page." Just yeah. something simple like that can make yeah. a difference in a child's ability to read. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I think, uh, um, you know, we've actually there's a whole group of uh, researchers who are studying that uh, um, it's not just students with, you know, dyslexia. And like I was saying, I think every one of us learn difference. In fact, I believe that there is a particular font, you know, type and spacing and all of that that actually helps any reader maximize their reading ability, their reading speed and comprehension. And so. Uh, they're working towards what if, you know, just changing the way we perceive, you know, which is, you know, mostly when we have books there in a fixed text, but thinking about the fact that really all of us have our own particular style of reading and how can we bring that along? Yeah. You know, as you were talking about putting the ruler underneath the, the lines, I, I remember using my finger a hundred years ago as I was learning how to read and teachers were not happy about that. They were like, get the finger off the page. Oh my God, I think my kids have heard me scold them all the time, being like, put your finger there, you will not jump lines. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you, you bring up a good point that I think we've, we've talked about here in the podcast a lot. And the fact that we all learn differently. And wouldn't it be wonderful if instead of just expecting everybody to be able to fit into this kind of mold of, of learning um, that's been around, we say it's been around forever, but it's actually only been around for 100, 150 years or so. Mm -hmm. uh, so instead of everybody, you know, fitting into that, we assess kids as they come in and mm -hmm. say, uh, how is this child learning best? Mm -hmm. uh, and then adapt the, 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 the teaching to fit that kid's need. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that, uh, you know, we think that that's really the, you know, that's the basis of education and the future of education, right? I mean, we talk about, you know, how do we take education into the masses, personalize it, and there's so much we can do with technology and technological advances so that, you know, you can provide this personalization to a student, whether it be in their reading experience or in their learning journey. So uh, I think I'm really excited about that. I think it, you know, will particularly be helpful to those that we serve and our users and those who learn differently, but it is everyone. It is going to help everyone. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of that, um, we've talked a lot and certainly uh, my beautiful wife and I've talked uh, about her student. She worked in the Boston public school system. And she was saying, you know, one of the things um, that uh, was a barrier for hair kids were they didn't have the money to go out and buy um, a lot of books to have around the house. Um, a lot of her students were from different countries. The parents weren't uh, accustomed to going to a library or something like that. Um, how can Benetech help those folks who don't have the financial resources that other families might have. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is this is why it makes it right. And I think that you know, if if you have the means, 
you know, you'll find your way, you might go and buy an audio book or something and, um, you know, be able to do the what is needed. It's harder for like textbooks, but, you know, for at least recreational reading, you can, you know, find a way to do that. I think that's, that's the beauty of us, right? I think that, uh, um, you know, as a nonprofit, we work hard to make sure this resource is completely free, right? Um, we are not, uh, um, because we understand that, you know, schools and parents and where you are depends a lot and you know what what's the color of your skin and so on and so forth what zip code you are in determines your ability to access these accommodations and resources either yourself or through your school um and we want to eliminate those sorts of barriers right so uh for, for particularly for you know i think if you're not you know used to going to a library and i think now these kids are so used to in all these schools they go there you know they're they're at, you know they get access to all these different sorts of digital tools and edtech tools but not all of them really are built to you know support the type of personalization and accommodations needed for those with disabilities right uh they're trying to, to cater to the masses uh but yeah if you go on to uh to bookshare uh you you know, and we're trying to get the word out and you know I thank you for helping us get the word out here but you know if you go on to bookshare it is you know it is it is it is it is free access to these books right and you can it's not you know also sometimes the library system you go get a book and then you have to have the physical ability to go back and return the book or if you're using a digital library service you check out a book and you either have to place a hole and wait for the book to come none of that instantaneously you get access to these books right so uh, uh you know i think we've we've been we've, we've been really trying to limit the barriers it is right our goal is that um you know this is here's a huge library you read a book you know you like it you can read another book uh and so on and so forth so and you don't have to you know move from your you know from from your home or wherever it is that you have access uh to these uh, you know, you can read it on your mobile phone, you can read it on, uh, um, you know, on a tablet or your, you know, on your laptop, on a, a smart speaker, all sorts of these different uh, ways. So, uh, you know, I'd encourage folks to, you know, to tap into this resource because it's free and because it's really over the years, you know, really helped change the lives of many people. Yeah. As as I was, as you were speaking there, I I, I thought back again, my, my, my beautiful wife or a lot of her students' parents didn't speak English. Mm. And so I'm thinking, wow, they could get one of those text to talk books that highlighted the words. They can snuggle up on the couch together and hear, and the parent can um, mm. start to listen, maybe start to learn a little bit of English. But the biggest thing is just being together. And f I, I launched the podcast to to celebrate the bond that grows yeah. between parent and kid while they're reading, and how wonderful it it would be. Um, that this technology can help that to happen for fo folks who can't read English. Yeah, no, absolutely. So first of all, yeah, definitely we are, we have um, uh, our collection is in over seventy languages. So um, um, yeah, there's a good chance you'll find something for yourself. Um, um, it's it's funny when I take the way my kids, I'm always looking for the language sections, and I'm like, oh my god, there's only ten books here in this language. So you know, it's it's it, having such a large digital collection does mean there's a lot of books in different languages. The site itself is also in Spanish, so you can you know go ahead and navigate that. Um, but I think the the um, uh, you know what's what's really exciting about this is like you mentioned, there's different modalities of how this can bring parents and kids or caregivers and kids together, right? I think that. Uh, uh, for those who have difficulty reading, it can be challenging. I think of a, you know, a kid with dyslexia and you're a parent for them and, you know, opening a print book and trying to read with them and they're frustrated. You know, it's not too much difference to swap that with the, you know, low cost cell phone and, you know, read it with on your, on the smartphone with some of these, uh, typography and other accommodations, right? Or I think even vice versa. Think of it like you were describing, right? Either the parent doesn't know the language as strongly or, uh, not a, I'll be honest, I'm not a great reader, right? I mean, I, I read well, but I don't read fast. And sometimes I, uh, when I'm reading out loud, I sometimes get conscious, like when I'm reading with my kids, you know, I'm like, you know, I, I'm they're, they're going to think I'm not as good as a reader. And, uh, you know, it helps remove those barriers too, because it alleviates some of that because it provides some accommodations that could be helpful for, a, a, you know, a parent or caregiver as well. So, you know, hopefully this is, you know, this is something that brings, you know, uh, kids together. That's why your podcast has been really, I think, you know, really been pushing for this. And, you know, hopefully this is a, this is an additional tool that can be helpful in accessing, um, you know, accessing these books um, in a way that you know, can help uh, particularly those who might be struggling with reading a print book. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, and myself, I, um, I, my used to love reading 
while I was working out. Mm-hmm. And uh, a long time ago, you know, that meant a paperback book and it would be it had a rubber band to the, the elliptical and, you know, it was, a, it was a big thing. And then the Kindle came along and that was great. Uh, but I'm almost 100 years old. So the eyes don't work. You put the glasses on, you're sweating into it. So I did the text to talk um, mm-hmm. with my Kindle and it was a game changer. It was fantastic. Yeah. And I love audiobooks. And there's so many ways to experience stories and we have the technology today and um and and i'm blessed that i can afford the kindle and the books and all that other kind of stuff but i'm so psyched that a site like yours is going to allow everyone to access these these resources yeah no thank you i mean i think that um um, you know, this is why we exist as a nonprofit, right? We're not selling into school districts or to to parents, right? Um, and it is about you know providing this resource that can be uh, can be helpful. And look, we're trying to do all sorts of other things, right? I know we're talking a lot about reading, particularly at younger ages, but you know, reading is a is you know you first learn to read and then you read to learn. So you know, uh, and we want to make sure that we're also in that journey. So we've been working a lot in just trying to make all sorts of content and not just uh, uh, literature content, but, you know, science and technology, engineering, math content, so that, you know, you have a, a lifetime of uh, being able to uh, read and then learn to read and enjoy reading and, and enjoy learning, which is at the end of the day what, uh, um, you know, what reading allows us to do. So, um, um, yeah. Yeah, well, I'm psyched and I'm really glad you're looking to tackle those other subjects because I, I'm imagining, you know, kids, there, there might be kids out there who can, you know, read without a problem. But when it comes to math and technology, it's, you know, um, something completely different. So um, bravo, bravo. Um, how can we, other than just getting the word out there, uh, are there other ways that we can help support Benetech? Do, do we should we write our senators and say give them more money or anything like that? <laughs> oh, we're definitely thankful to the Department of Education, and if you if you if you do find this useful, yes, it is. You're welcome to send a note to uh, to your your representative or senator and uh, and all of that. I think that uh, you know I think it's really important. I think I feel that uh, having you know publicly supported resources like this is very important, particularly since. You know, we're in a world in which we're seeing a lot of commercialization of education and education technology resources. So, um, you know, we want to make sure that something like this is preserved in its utility to serve all, right? I mean, I think that's the that's the issue. There's so many advances in 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 uh, in, in technology and tools that uh, um, really only are not distributed equitably. And so, you know, with this our our our, our reason for existence is to make sure that this gets to those who are struggling. This gets to an understanding that it's uh, you know it's there those who are you know, struggling in a particular zip code is, could be different from others or, uh, you know, so on and so forth. So, you know, we want to make sure that we can get this to all. I mean, I think, look, first of all, if you're a teacher uh, or, you know, this is this is a tool, you know, that can be used. It can be used in special ed. It can be used in general ed. Uh, you know, I there are some, uh, uh, you know, I think teachers get overly worried about, oh, is this only to be used in, a, you know, if a student has an IEP or not? No, this can be used if, you know, a student has, there's a competent authority that can say that, hey, this is an accommodation that's going to be helpful to a student. Um, so, you know, I, I do encourage teachers to uh, take a deeper look at something like this that can be applicable. Uh, in fact, most of our students tend to be in gen ed classrooms. So, um, you know, definitely encourage teachers to, and come to us. We have so many training resources uh, that can help you and how you can, you know, incorporate this into your classroom. And then for uh, parents, you know, I mean, I think that, you know, I would I would encourage, you know, audiobooks are great and that's a good way to, you know, to turn to those. But it is important for students to be able to, particularly if you have a learning difference, uh, you know, manipulate text and learn with text. So, uh, you know, don't uh, don't overly rely on on the, um, you know on audio tools. Do get them involved in being able to, uh, you know, with tools such as this that get them familiarity with text so that it's not as big of a barrier for them. Um, and uh, tell us how this you use this. You might inspire us to do things that uh, we may not have thought about. Um, so, uh, and we're happy to then adjust this to be even more useful for you and if you don't like something or you like a particular book in a collection we do that too right if you're if you if you have a, a book that you, you know your teacher uh, assigned to you for your school and you don't have it 
we'll we'll figure out how we can go in and get that book, and that's a pretty cool service too. So awesome! And uh, we have lots of authors who listen to the show. If there's an author out there, and they say, "I, I'd love for my book to be part of this," uh, how can what can they do? We're, that's amazing, and you know, you guys do such a great job of having so many diverse books and and relevant books. They can literally come to Bookshare and say that, "Hey." We realize that this could be helpful for folks, and the, you know we'll work with them to get their book onto Bookshare. Uh, this is, uh, you know, we're a nonprofit, so we take those books as part of a, of a sort of a donation and under like copyright laws that allow us to be able to do that. And you know that will, you know that will help get uh, get your books in front of uh, readers who, uh, you know, who who may not necessarily find the find it otherwise. So. Um, you know, definitely encourage any any author. I mean, all of all the folks who are coming to your show really care about the work they do, and so it's a it's a you know it's an easy way to help amplify their work and their readership as well. Awesome, we've had a really eye opening time speaking. Oh, we get a, a, to get to Bookshare to get to Benetech. What's the best address for folks to start with? Absolutely. I mean, you're, you're going to go to go to Bookshare. So go to Bookshare.org. It's, uh, you know, uh, uh, simple enough. You can go on pretty much any device. And once you're on Bookshare.org, you can, you know, choose the experience, whether you're a parent or, you know, or a student or a teacher and, uh, uh, you know, get a, you get access to a ton of resources. So, yes, please go to Bookshare.org if you want to access Bookshare. Yeah. And I, 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 just as you were thinking about that, I'm thinking, you know, um, homeschooling teach uh, home, homeschooling families and right. i'm a, a really big advocate and i believe very sincerely that as parents we are our kids first and most important teachers um so get on book bookshare.org yeah exactly and take take advantage just because it says parents and teacher you can click on the teachers and get over there and get those resources no one's gonna yell at you <laughs> We've had a really eye-opening time speaking to uh, the, the CEO of Benetech and telling us about Bookshare.org. Our guest has been Ian Kishore. Ian, thank you so much for being with us. Jet, thanks so much, and kudos to all of you. Hey there, families. Are you looking for an exciting way to bond and learn together? Look no further than our STEM is Family Fun video series. Join us as we explore the fascinating world of STEM through hands-on activities right in your own home. Our series features lessons from experts at renowned institutions like the San Diego Children's Discovery Museum, the National Children's Museum in Washington, D.C., and Children's Museum Houston. From making homemade rainbow bridges to creating an oboe out of a straw, there's something for everyone in the family to enjoy. So grab your lab coats and get ready for an adventure. Go to readingwithyourkids.com and click on the STEM is Family Fun link at the top of the page and let the learning and laughter begin. STEM is Family Fun, where learning and bonding go hand in hand. Join us right now from Durham in the state of North Carolina. Our guest is here today to celebrate her book. It's called I Would Love You Still. Please welcome to the show Dr. Adria Theodore. Dr. Adria, how are you? I'm doing good. How are you? Wonderful. I love the title of your book. Thank you. <laughs> I love it too. Yeah, and, you know, the um, the cover art is just – it reminds me um, – especially with my daughter when when she was young 4 or 5 years old i would just love reading books like this to her um just as another way to remind her how much i loved her exactly that is the whole purpose of the book is yeah. to be able to talk to little kids mostly preschoolers but certainly some older kids um and let them know that you really love them yeah. no matter what I know that there's somebody out there listening saying, why do we need a book to tell our kids that we love them? I mean, you know, it's just say, I love you. That's it. <laughs> but it's a little bit different than that. Talk a little bit about the book and about how it, it makes the message stronger. Well, I think for one thing, there are some families, lots of families that I know, where saying I love you really doesn't happen very often. For some people, it's really, really hard, um, whether it's that their family never said it or that they don't really feel it. Um, and there are some families where I love you is really something that you show, not something that you say. Um, and so I think sometimes when you have a book where love you, I love you is being said in the book, it gives people an opportunity to practice saying 
the words, I love you, I would love you still. And even the title here, I would love you still, is not saying I love you directly. So it's kind of an indirect way of being able to say I love you. Um, but I think it's important for kids to hear that, um, that they are loved. So that's one thing. The book itself is about um, a parent and a child who are on an outing at the zoo. Um, they're having a special outing. And the way that the words are written, if you just read them, you don't know necessarily that it's a mom and a daughter, but that's what's being illustrated in the book is a mom and a daughter on an outing to the zoo. And in this special outing, the mom takes that opportunity to <laughs> explain and express to the child how much she would love the, how much she loves her daughter, um, regardless of how she behaves, how she acts, how she looks, what she eats, um, all the different things, how she behaves, maybe act like, like an animal. Um, but even in those cases, she loves her daughter. You know, that's, I, I think that's so important. And I think it's, it's such, I think it's something that I, I don't think parents think about enough, helping, have, helping our kids understand that no matter what happens, we're going to love you forever. That, that love is unconditional. Exactly. I think that um, <laughs> I like to think of a, a funny story with my own daughter one time when she was, was really small and she had a crayon and she wrote on the wall. And then she looked at me and she said, uh-oh, <laughs> like she was going to be in trouble. <laughs> and so I was telling her, well, that's not really an uh-oh because you kind of did it on purpose. Um, but I was still, you know, very, very um, forgiving of her <laughs> for that little infraction. <laughs> Um, but, yeah, I think kids are always looking to see whether or not they're going to be loved or are they going to get in trouble uh, if something's going to happen to them. Um, yeah, you, you're right. Kids do kind of test that often. Exactly. They do. Yeah. <laughs> now, you are a pediatrician, and so you know of what you speak. Can you talk a, a, a little bit about um, this isn't just – something that you feel like, oh, it, it, it's nice to tell our kids that they love. I'm, I'm seeing things that tells us that when kids feel loved, when they're happy, when they're living gratefully, there's actually physical benefits that go with that. There are, the kids are healthier. Yes, I think that they are. Um, certainly when kids, uh, I think the opposite is, is sort of easier to see, mm -hmm. is that when kids are not in situations where they are loved and where they're protected and where they're feeling safe, that we see lots of, of effects on their physical bodies. And um, there's a, a major study of, of things called the Adverse Childhood Events Study, um, where they followed people who had adverse events when they were in childhood, um, and they saw sort of long-term how they had greater risk for other kinds of bad outcomes and bad health outcomes and, and um, mental health outcomes when they were older because of the things that they experienced in childhood. So we know from those kinds of studies that when kids are not in places where they are feeling safe and protected when they're young um, and they're experiencing negative things, that that can have outcomes, that negative outcomes. And so the opposite is also true, that when they are feeling safe um, and protected and nurtured, that there are positive benefits for their, for their long-term health, both physical yeah. health and mental health and emotional health. Yeah. You know, we've, we've talked here on the podcast about how smart it would be if we made more of an investment in our kids when they're younger and uh, that if we make those investments uh, with with our young kids then we're going to see a benefit on the other end because we won't be needing to pay as much for prisons and for rehabs and and all that other kind of stuff exactly yeah there have been lots of lots of studies that talk about that and i think reading to your child um, when they're young is one of those ways to do that. And it doesn't cost a whole lot. I mean, you can go to the library and get tons of books for free. You just get a library card. Um, or you can go to the bookstore and buy lots of books. But certainly reading to your kid, having books at home uh, for your kid, um, talking with them early increases their vocabulary, increases their comprehension, increases um, you know their brain growth when they're small. So in that sort of birth to five year range, especially the birth to three year is when the, the brain is really growing very fast. Um, and we've known from lots of different studies that, that taking the time to do that helps those children um, long term. Mm -hmm. um, the kids who are being read to, they have a greater vocabulary when they get to school and they have more school readiness. And that leads to them, you know, being more likely to graduate from high school and all the things that go along with that. So I think certainly starting um, at an early age with reading to your kid is just one small thing that you can do that actually has major um, effects for them later in life. 
Yeah, I, I absolutely. My my beautiful wife taught here in the Boston Public Schools for thirty four years, and one of the things that I used to um, ask her and her best friend, who is a, an administrator, I. I'm guessing, I haven't done a study, but I'm guessing that most of the people who are listening to Reading With Your Kids, I'm, I'm probably p- preaching to the choir. They, <laughs> probably, they listen probably. to the show because <laughs> they, they believe in it and they love books. Exactly. Um, how do you think, and I asked my, my wife, uh, how do we get the, the parents of your kids in, in the inner city here, how can we get them to read with their kids more? And the, their, their observation was, you know, my, a lot of my parents – uh, they're working three jobs to to come home, or they don't speak English, or they don't they're not comfortable reading themselves. How do you think we can, as a society, best support those families so we can give those kids the the benefits of reading, so they can get to they can get to school with the same vocabulary that my kids get to school with. Well, I think part of it is letting people know that there are lots of resources that are available. So, for example, um, just one example, our uh, public publisher, Holiday House, they have a story time, which is online, that um, they do a new, a new book every Thursday, I believe it is, in the morning from 10 to 10.30. And, of course, it's, it's recorded, so you can watch it any time. Um, but they have authors who read their books, um, and they show the pictures. And so the kids who, you know, aren't very well efficient in, in English or parents who aren't as efficient in English who have trouble reading to their kids, they can sit with their child watching the video and go through the story. And so in that way, there are, there are ways to get kids stories and expose them to language um, that even if a parent in themselves is not as, as comfortable that they can have access to that. And so that's just one example of lots of different ways that, that kids can get access to stories. There are audiobooks that are available that you can check out at the library. Mm-hmm. Um, there are, you know, lots of Sesame Street stories and um, other kinds of podcasts that are available for, for families to take advantage of that. Yeah. I'm curious. You're a pediatrician. You volunteer at, at a local um, uh, nonprofit. Uh, where do you find the time? to write kids books <laughs> well i don't i don't volunteer at the center i actually work at the center <laughs> although i do work part-time so yeah um and i think that's part of it is that i work part-time and so i'm not i'm not working full-time and so that part of me that's working part-time um the other part of my life is, is thinking about liter- literature or literacy um about writing and reading um for kids and so that's kind of where i found the time to think about writing for kids. It took me a long time <laughs> to get here, but thinking about it sort of on a part-time basis and trying to understand going from a, you know, a medical center and writing research papers for, for physicians and curriculum for medical students to thinking about how to write for children. Um, it was a process that took a, it took a long time to be able to, to understand how the, how the books are, are structured and so on. And so, yeah, but it took me a little bit of time to get here. <laughs> What's what's more fun, writing picture books or uh, medical reports? Oh, let me see. That that's not hard. <laughs> <laughs> writing picture books for sure, <laughs> and reading them for sure. <laughs> you obviously have a passion for literacy, and so I'll ask you the same question I asked Lavar Burton when he was on the podcast. Where does that passion come from? Oh gosh, I don't know. It's been there forever since I was real little. I loved reading when I was a kid. I loved stories. I loved going to the library. I always had a book in my hand, and if I didn't have a book, I had something else to read, a magazine or, you know, a milk carton. I don't know. <laughs> Anything. A love for words and language was, was always there in me. So, um, and I've written in other, other kinds of venues, you know, for my church and for the, for the school and for the School of Medicine and, and lots of different places and, and my own personal journaling. Um, so I don't know exactly where it came from, but it's always been there for me. That's right. You, you know, you reminded me talking about reading the milk carton. Um, boy, I, <laughs> I read the back of uh, Frosted Flakes. I don't know how many times um, <laughs> those cereal boxes, and, and they never changed. But I had to read them every time I sat down. And, and well, sometimes and, sometimes they had puzzles on them. You know, the the cereal they boxes they had puzzles and word finds and you know mazes and things you could do. So yeah, there was there were things to read. <laughs> Hey, you know, one thing um, we've we've talked about here in the podcast uh, is the uh, the uh, the screens that our kids are 
are, are exposed to these days. I, when I was taking a media literacy class maybe 10, 15 years ago at that time, um, we were concerned because the study said that, that most kids were exposed to 3,000 media messages a day from billboards and radio and movies and television. I'm imagining now with the advent of, of smartphones and devices and uh, video games that that number of messages that our kids are exposed to has probably quadrupled or, or just, <laughs> just exploded. A lot. Can you talk a little bit about your kind of views on, on screens and advice to parents as to how, when kids should get their first screen and for how long should they, they spend time on it? Well, I think that, um, like everything, <laughs> we should do things in moderation. Mm -hmm. um, and I certainly think that for really young children, um, their recommendations about you know not having them have exposure to screens before the age of two, um, that they don't really need the screens. Um, and then I think that there are probably um, gradations of that after that particular age. Um, I know that years ago when they first started sort of transitioning to um, sort of books, I guess digital books, um, there was a lot of a concern that, um, that the print um, book would go away. And I think that we found that for, for children and for parents especially, they don't necessarily want that for their kids. They want them to have physical books <laughs> to read and the kids actually prefer to read those. Um, so that would be my, my thoughts is that for those, I don't think there's a specific age range um, in terms of when you would not necessarily keep them away from the screen, but I think you can monitor, you know, how much time they have on the screen and, um, give them other options as well. Yeah, yeah. Tell me, are, are there more books coming from Dr. Adria? Um, I hope so. I don't have any in the works right now, but I'm, I'm certainly working on some, um, but I don't have any in the pipeline at this point in time. Awesome. Well, we should tell everybody where they can go to find out more about I Would Love You Still and find out more about you. Well, I have a website. It's just adriatheodore.com, and that's probably the best place to go for now. Awesome. We've had a wonderful time speaking to the author of I Would Love You Still. Our guest has been Dr. Adria Theodore. Dr. Adria, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. Before we invite our guest into the studio, I would love to invite you to visit a very special website. It's clownswithoutborders.org. Clownswithoutborders.org. This is a group that I absolutely adore. I am part of of Clowns Without Borders, and I had the honor of being part of the 2023 tour of El Salvador. I had so much fun joining with artists from all over the world to bring a smile to people who really needed it and, and, and really appreciated it, too. And we would love for you to join us as a monthly joy maker. Uh, the joy makers, they're a family of people just like you who love to laugh and make other people feel good. So please take a moment and visit clownswithoutborders.org and consider joining me as a joy maker. Join us right now from Washington, D.C., our nation's capital. I'm really excited today. Our guest is the director of the National Library Service. Please welcome to the show Jason Broughton. Hey, Jason, how are you? Good morning. Thank you for having me. I am really pleased to be here. And I know it took us a little bit of time based on my schedules, but I am just humbled and happy to be here with you. Well, you know, all the best things come to those who wait and have patience. Oh, I would definitely say, and I, I don't want to say you would say the best for last, but I think I have a lot to discuss. That would be really, really wonderful for people to um, think about and also just know about what we do. Yeah. So tell us about the National Library. People are familiar with their school libraries and their local public libraries and their little free libraries, but I don't think a lot of people know what the National Library, Library Service is all about. All right, so let me try to give you a snapshot because I know we only have a little bit of time and I can be a conversationalist, so I love to talk, so just know that that's a dangerous thing with me. But within that, I would say the National Library Service is a part of the Library of Congress. We have been around for 91 years, celebrating our 91st. 
uh, this, this year, 90 was last year, which was really, really nice. And with that, our full name is the National Library Service for the Blind and Print Disabled. And within that, we are free service that allows people to have access to materials who qualify for them in which they can have things what are known as talking books, which is kind of like a thumb drive in the sense that's in a specific uh, shell-style cartridge that goes into a unique device along with Braille and a host of other things for people who cannot, in a sense, read standard, um, I would say, print within that. And again, there's a little bit of an eligibility requirement. We make this, however, accessible through a network of libraries. We have 94 of them across the country and in U.S. territories. And within that, it has access to books, magazines, musical scores, um, and a host of other things. The way I like to describe it is whatever you and I, as a sighted person, have access to, people who are visually impaired or print disabled should also have access to. And that is the goal of our service uh, within that. We have, I would say, a catalog that is, is quite extensive. And there's some other things I'll talk about later on that has helped to expand our, I would say, uh, collection in a variety of different ways that people might not know about. And within it, it's called the Marrakesh Treaty, in which we have agreements that we are able to receive and also send different types of materials from across the world. Wow. That's, so, yes. that's amazing. Now, 91 years ago, we back in the, the, <laughs> the 80s, back in the 80s, um, we passed the um, Americans with Disabilities Act. But this, the, this service was created long before that. Who, whose brainchild was this? Oh, my goodness. This came, I don't know the specifics, but I definitely was one of the uh, president's wives had a conversation about the need to ensure that materials be in the Library of Congress, because there were basically, you know, these reading rooms. And in part of that, we had a war in which a lot of the veterans within that um, situation were not kind of afforded the same types of items. And that began the conversation to kind of establish a reading room that allowed those with these types of disabilities, particularly vision impairment at the time, basically blind and a host of other things, to have access to that. Now, when I state that, here's why it's very unique. As a part of our, I would say, mission, which is really a mandate that's in legislation, we have two specific caveats that we must always adhere to, and that is going to be to provide resources for the blind, and what we call the print disabled, the former word used to be kind of like handicapped. We no longer use that. That has been kind of um, removed and updated in, in a sense. And the other is to veterans. Mm. And because of that, those are our main two areas. But within that, we have an umbrella of things that are afforded us a wonderful opportunity to provide services to a host of people within that umbrella. And in coming on your show today, one of the areas that people might not know that we also are navigating um, to provide services is to young people and young adults, particularly children, and for those parents who might not know that we would be doing this through um, reading disabilities can mm -hmm. also qualify for our service as well. So uh, a, a kid who is uh, struggling with uh, a severe form of dyslexia, perhaps, dyslexia yes. or other types Fair. of learning challenges? You hit the nail on the head within that. What we want to make sure, which I know a lot of your listeners do, is that people really understand, I would say probably on your show, what the value of literacy means and how it can open the door to a young person's, I would say, life and pretty much change it forever. A book does do that for you. And within that, what we try to do is to make sure that children of all calibers who are eligible for our program have access to that. And that can come in a whole host of ways in looking at different types of titles. This is a little bit different than I would say we don't do, for example, textbooks. We do all the other types of things. And, again, it can come in a whole host of formats. As I said, it could come through what is known as the talking book service, an audio cartridge. It can also come online on your own device, which we have a thing called BARD, which is our online platform where it can be delivered to you. We also have Braille. And um, if we have a little bit of time, I can even talk about some technological advances in which we have eBraille. Now, people might find that kind of like, what do you mean eBraille? Yes, we now have devices. If you can imagine it, a little device, something like a rectangular um, object, and it has 
what are known as pins instead of the dots. Those dots have been transformed into metal pins that actually can move up and down as a person's finger rolls across that and allows it to kind of be like a movable style of, I would say, communication. And it's getting faster and it's getting better. And within that, we are seen as, I would say, um, a leader mm -hmm. on the frontier of technology with this. That might sound kind of interesting for people to know that the government on this one is kind of not taking lead, but definitely amongst the pack. And we are uh, doing a lot of prototypes. We have a pilot out across the country in which we've just had a lot of enthusiasm on, uh, I would say, piloting this device where people want to kind of come into the pilot because when they have received it, they cannot believe that there is now technology that, that allows them to electronically play with Braille. That's really amazing. And what a, what a wonderful gift that is to folks who didn't have access to that before. You are fully correct on that. It can be life-changing is the best way to say that. Now, of course, if anything, which is a total separate conversation, younger people have the advantage because they are going to be growing up as a digital native, if people haven't heard those types of terms. Uh, digital native, you you kind of born with the technology. It's kind of there with you. We normally also have a different population. In other words, I like to say the mature uh, crowd, which might not have had technology at the forefront or persons who had to transition because of age and losing sight and vision, they then have to get used to learning the technology, and we try to make that as easy as possible. But young people coming into this, they are very adept, they're very skilled, and we see that as a bit of the way of the future. So within that, we have, again, as I said, a lot of things that I think they would be really, really uh, pleased to note we have. One of our biggest things that, on top of our, our collection with children's books, young adult books, that people might not know is that we have the world's largest Braille music collection. Yes, okay. in the world. <laughs> people might not know that. Now, when I say this, it probably, um, you'd have to come physically see it. We do offer tours, but not so much now. But we do, if you ever want to come visit in D.C., we would have it to show it to you. Because it has a wonderful amount of information and a wonderful staff that deals with it. For example, it has method books if you want to, in a sense, learn a musical instrument. And we have had a lot of parents and children utilize that. We have training items. We also have musical scores, sheet music, and music appreciation style items. And a host of different types of musical genres something for everybody so we can go from jazz to religious to choral to a whole host of things and if we don't have it since that we are a library we will try to work to find out how we can get you to someone who might know what you are seeking we have people call us directly to say i'm looking for this musical score or whatever else i will say as a heartwarming thing which my job is just wonderfully humbling <laughs> our organization and our network libraries will receive mail phone calls from patrons, and I can give you one. I was um, the state librarian in Vermont before I was appointed in this position, and we used to receive these wonderful letters from patrons talking about the service. Well, when I arrived here, we ended up getting a wonderful letter that I just was just so, oh, my goodness, it, not cry as a man, but you would say, oh, this is just heartwarming, where a person let us know that they were extremely proud of us being here for their child because they were going to have their first music recital at the Met, in a sense. Wow. And so within that, as a recital, I mean, think about that. You're, you're doing big-time recitals with us being an entity that could provide you the basic musical items for practice um, instrumentation as a visually impaired person. What a life-changing thing um, to actually be able to provide to people, in a sense, for things that some of us might not have really considered because we don't have to kind of navigate that world. There, you, I think, hit the nail on the head, is that there's so much that challenges people that, that we don't think about. So many things that we take for granted um, day to day that uh, other people, it's just a mountain that they're not able to get around without some assistance. And it's wonderful that as a nation, we've made this um, a priority to, to, to help and to have a service like the National Library Service. Well, we, I, I appreciate that. I would say one way of 
in what you just said, one way if somebody wanted to kind of examine this is, and it is something I think a lot of people should always keep in mind, life can change in an instant mm -hmm. in a variety of ways that we might not have expected, and you want to know what you have access to. So if you wanted to kind of examine what Braille, for example, is, we have something that educators use, which is to introduce what we would say sighted children and sighted people to Braille and accessibility, because that's our I would say our theme, is that we have a way of allowing people to do a color by number style activity. And if you go to our website, you can find that activity to kind of understand how Braille works and how you actually can kind of learn it. Hmm. Because a lot of people sometimes don't think about, well, how did that really work? Mm -hmm. You know, feeling these dots. Um, I, I will say there was something that I found amusing, but it's really not amusing, is I, I did see someone try to do something nice, and I call it no good deed goes unpunished, which is Braille has a specific feel. You cannot just print out dots on a page and think that that is Braille <laughs> and give back to a person. It's not going to work. So um, it does have a feel that goes along with it. But this activity, of course, would show you what that kind of translates into, into a vocabulary, which allows a person to feel what is being stated or said. I will say the technology that we have that is coming out in very soon, I would say a couple uh, of years, it might sound kind of long, but very, very soon, the electronic Braille or the e-Braille, the pins are now moving so fast up and down that there might come a time rather soon, I've seen some wonderful prototypes, where a person can be in a presentation with a visual slide, and that slide could actually come onto this device and actually have the image where the person can feel the image of the slide wow. and what's on it. Imagine that where we, we just didn't even have that before. That's incredible. Now, the thing is, everybody's going to want one when these things come out, and our goal is to try to figure out how to make that happen. So... <laughs> We've had a really fascinating time speaking to the director of the National Library Service, Jason Broughton. Jason, thank you so very much for being with us. Jed, thank you, and I apologize for not coming on as soon as I wanted to, but there was a thing called Congress and Hearing that I needed to take care of, and that kind of got in our way. But I am here now. I we hope you've enjoyed this episode of Reading with Your Kids, and will join us for the next exciting episode of the show. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, we want to start by thanking our guest, Dr. Adria Theodore, Ian Kishore, and of course, Jason Brotman. I want to thank my amazing team, Fatima Khan, Chris Doherty, Rory Grady, Judy Hu, Stella Shere, Hannah Bosange, Alyssa Montiero, Julia Lippman, Devin Hill, Riley Oluhu. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me, but most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today, and as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place, and you do that every time you read with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next episode of Reading With Your Kids.